Hey everyone, thanks very much for joining me on this video. I thought I would uh, do a commemoration of uh, the D-Day landings. I've got a lovely Sands of Normandy uh, Zippo lighter set I bought uh, when the 60th anniversary was. Um, I haven't opened the booklet though, so I thought, well, uh, it would make sense to open it today. So, um, thanks very much for joining me on this video. If you're new, please hit the subscribe button, comment, and uh, comment down below. Please like the video. And I've got a lovely 1944 Mercury Dime as well that I can put it up. Parker, Ebert, uh, Penny Hoarder, how are you doing today? Um, I thought I'd do a video for the D-Day commemorations, uh, 75th anniversary. Urban Silverstack, and good morning. Good morning to my American viewers. Um, it's uh, funny enough, the D-Day landings um, started at 6.30 this morning, um, 75 years ago. So uh, for some of my American viewers, it might be 6.30 or just past 6.30. Uh, D-Day would have effectively started. So um, I've got an array of things. I'm just going to live stream for as long as I can. Uh, I'm going to go through my uh, Zippo lighter set there. I've got a uh, 1944 Mercury Dime as well, which we'll take a look at. But um, we'll get things started. So um, the Normandy landings uh, commenced on Tuesday, the 6th of June, uh, 1944. Um, it was the Al Allied invasion of Normandy in Operation Overlord, World War II. John RMS is here. Uh, Illinois, <laughs> Illinois at 7.35, cool, well, look, um, I missed you by an hour there, <laughs> but I suspect it'll probably get earlier um, as, as time goes for some of the American viewers out there. John, I saw your video earlier there, thanks very much buddy, thanks for thanks for dropping in. Uh, codename Operation Neptune, and often referred to as D-Day, it was the largest seaborne invasion in history. The operation began at the liberation of the German-occupied France, and later Western Europe, from Nazi control and laid the foundations of the Allied victory on the Western Front. Uh, planning in, uh, for the operation began in 1943, excuse me, in, in the months leading up to the invasion. Uh, the Allies conducted a substantial military uh, deception, codenamed Operation Bodyguard, to mislead the Germans as to the date and the location of the main Allied landings. The weather on the day was far from ideal, and the operation had to be delayed uh, tw by 24 hours so for those obviously the d-day minus one celebration started yesterday they always refer to d-day being obviously d-day and then you got plus one plus two plus three and d-day minus one was the preparation in regards to the actual official uh, landings that commenced uh, today so a special thank you for obviously for those um that had family um that fought during world war ii my grandfather unfortunately was too young at that time he he later served in the uh, the occupational forces in in italy in 1946 uh, so he had missed the war by um, at least a year um, so he was um he was he was too young to enlist at that time to be to see full full action but was part of the allied um, occupation of italy in 1946 so um, at least there's some connection there um Anyway, back to the uh, back to the description. Um, uh, the weather on D-Day, obviously, what, it was delayed by 24 hours. A further postponement would have meant a delay of at least two weeks, as the invasion planners had had requirements for for the for the phase um, of the moon, the tides, and the time of day. That meant um, only a few days each month were deemed suitable. So obviously, if they'd missed uh, their uh, their um, their chance, now they would have had to delay it by, by possibly up to two weeks. Um, Adolf Hitler placed German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who was uh, also known as the Desert Fox, in command of German forces and developing fortifications along the Atlantic Wall in anticipation of an Allied invasion. The amphibious landings were preceded by the extensive aerial and naval bombardments of an airborne assault and the landing of 24,000 US, British, Canadian airborne troops shortly after midnight. So obviously the airborne uh, divisions were deployed before the official landings at Normandy uh, to disrupt communications uh, behind enemy lines. Allied infantry and armoured divisions began landing on the coast of France at 6.30. Um, it doesn't say whether that's Eastern Standard Time. I suspect it's probably, it could mean 6.30, it could be an American time or 6.30, uh, probably 6.30 um, British time or um, Greenwich, Greenwich, Greenwich Meridian time. Uh, the target 50 mile, uh, 80 kilometer stretch of Normandy coast was divided into five sectors, which became known as Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. Strong winds blew the landing craft east of their intended positions, particularly at Utah and Omaha, which were the uh, main American uh, landings. Uh, John RMS says 6.30. 
<laughs> so that would have been 6.30 British time. Uh, strong winds. Uh, okay, beg your pardon, read that already. Uh, the men landed under heavy fire from gun emplacements overlooking the beaches, and the shore was mined and covered with obstacles such as wooden stakes, metal tripods, barbed wire, making the work uh, of the beach clearing teams difficult and dangerous. Casualties were the heaviest at Omaha, which is where the Americans fought. Uh, and it's high cliffs. Obviously, it was difficult to try and get above the actual cliffs or to get onto the cliffs. At Gold, Juno and Sword, several fortified towns were cleared in house-to-house -house fighting and two major gun emplacements at Gold were disabled using specialised tanks. The Allies failed to achieve um, any of their goals on the first day. Carantan and... Uh, I think it's pronounced it's a bear, it's one, it's one of the uh, French towns it remained in German hands and Cain, a major objective, or what might be pronounced Khan, um, were not captured until the 21st of July. Well, that was obviously some time. Only two of the beaches, Juno and Gold, were linked on the first day, and all five beachheads uh, were not contacted until the 12th of June. What time is there in Ireland? Yeah, the time is 1.40 in the afternoon. Thanks there, uh, Parker. Uh, okay. However, the operation gained a foothold, which the Allies gradually expanded over the coming months. German casualties on D-Day have been estimated at four to nine thousand men. Allied casualties were at least ten, were at least ten thousand, uh, with four thousand four hundred confirmed dead. Um, unfortunately, museums, memorials, and war cemeteries in the area uh, now host many visitors each year. After the, um, a bit of background, obviously, after the German uh, army invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, uh, the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, began pressing his new allies for the creation of a second front in Western Europe. In late May 1942, the Soviet Union and the United States made a joint announcement that a full understanding was reached with regards to the urgent task of creating a second front in Europe in 1942. However, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill persuaded US uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt to postpone the promised invasion. Um, even with US help, the Allies did not have adequate forces to, for such an activity. So obviously they needed to build up uh, men, machinery, uh, weaponry. <clears throat> Instead of the immediate uh, return to France, the Western Allies staged offensives in the Mediterranean theatre of operations where British troops were already stationed. Uh, by mid-1943, uh, the campaign in North America uh, had been won. The Allies then launched an invasion of Sicily in July 1943. Subsequently, the invaded Italian mainland in September uh, the same year. Well, uh, past lunchtime. Yeah, I'm afraid so. I haven't really had any lunch myself. Yeah, four to five hours ahead or behind. Um, by then, Soviet forces were on the offensive and won major victories at the Battle of Stalingrad. The decision uh, to undertake a cross-channel invasion within the next year was taken at the Trident Conference in Washington in May 1943. The initial planning was concentrated by a number of available landing craft, most, uh, most of which were already, already committed to the Mediterranean and the Pacific. At the Tehran Conference in November 1943, Roosevelt Churchill promised Stalin that they would open the long-delayed Second Front in May 1944. Four sites were considered for the landing. Brittany, uh, the Cot uh, Cot Cotentin Peninsula, which is Cherbourg, uh, Normandy, and uh, the Pas de Calais. As Brittany and uh, the uh, Cotentin uh, Peninsulas, which was Cherbourg, uh, would have been, um, it would have been possible for the Germans to cut off Allied advance at a relatively slow and narrow. Because it was a peninsula, they could have easily cut off the actual forces. Um, uh, with the with the uh, with the Pas de Calais being the closest point to continental Europe and Britain, the Germans considered the most likely initial landing zone. So it was um, the most heavily fortified region. Um, it um, but it offered few opportunities for expansion, as the area uh, bound by numerous rivers and canals, uh, whereas landings on the, on a broad front in Normandy would would permit. <clears throat> 
simultaneous threats against the port of Cherbourg. Excuse me. Uh, coastal ports uh, further west in Brittany and an overland attack towards Paris and eventually into Germany. Normandy was hence chosen as the landing site. The most serious drawback of the Normandy coast, the lack of port facilities, would be would be overcome through the deployment of official uh, Mulberry Harbours. A series of modified tanks nicknamed Hobart's Funnies um, <laughs> dealt with specific requirements uh, except for the Normandy uh, campaign, such as clearing mines. I guess uh, the Hobart's Funnies must have been some kind of water tank, probably. Um, it says the uh, unusually modified tanks operated during the Second World War by the 79th Armoured Division of the British Army or by specialist Royal Engineers. Um, Allies, uh, Allies planned to launch the invasion on the 1st of May 1944. The initial draft of the plan was to uh, was accepted by the Quebec Conference in August of 1943. Uh, John RMS says it was a semi-amphibious vehicle. Yeah, I suspect it probably had um, snorkels uh, so that they could obviously drive them into deep water, or at least you know uh, deep enough to get to get through. Uh, the Allies, um, the initial draft, obviously there you go. Dwight D. Eisen uh, Eisenhower was appointed commander of Supreme Headquarters Allied. Um, expeditionary force General Bernard Montgomery uh, who was a Brit was named uh, as commander of the 21st Army Group which compromised of land forces involved in the invasion on the 31st of December 1943 Eisenhower and Montgomery first saw the plan which proposed amphibious landings by three divisions with two more divisions in support the two generals immediately insisted that the scale of the initial invasion be expanded to five divisions with um, airborne dis um, descents by three additional divisions to allow operations on a wider front uh, and to speed the capture of Cherbourg. The need to acquire and produce extra landing craft for the expanded operations meant the invasion had to be delayed to June. Eventually 39 Allied divisions would be committed to the Battle of Normandy. 22 US, 12 British, 3 Canadian, 1 Polish, 1 French, totaling over a million troops. So you just imagine having a million troops on the coast of uh, of England. There must have been some site. Um, all under overall British command. Operations. Uh, Operation Overlord was named assigned to the establishment of a large-scale lodgement on the continent. The first phase, the amphibious, uh, sorry, amphibious invasion, um, establishment of a secure foothold was co codenamed Operation Neptune. Uh, to gain air superiority, uh, needed to ensure a successful invasion. The Allies undertook a bombing campaign codenamed Operation Blank Point that targeted German aircraft production, fuel supplies, and uh, airfields. Obviously, they needed to blunt the amount of um, um, uh, the German air superiority. Um, so they obviously had to target specific air, airfields, fuel supplies and production facilities. Uh, elaborate deceptions, codenamed Operation Bodyguard, were undertaken uh, in the months leading up to the invasion to prevent Germans from learning the timing and location of the invasion. The landings were to be uh, preceded by an airborne operation near, uh, near Cain on the, on the eastern flank to secure the Orne River bridges north of Carentan on the western flank. The Americans assigned uh, to land at Utah Beach and Omaha Beach were to attempt to capture Carentan and Saint uh, looks like Saint Lou uh, the first day, then cut um, then cut off the uh, Cottontan Peninsula, which is where Cherbourg Harbour is. Eventually, capture the port facilities at Cherbourg. The British had sword and gold beaches, and Canadians at Juno Juno Beach would protect the U.S. flanks. An attempt to establish airfield. Um, airfield near uh, near Cannes on the first day. Um, a secure lodgement would be established with all invading forces linking together an attempt uh, made to hold all, all territory north of the Avaranches uh, Falaise uh, line within the first three weeks. Montgomery env uh, envisaged a 90-day battle lasting until the Allied forces reached the river the river scene. Decept obviously, there was a number of deception plans which were mentioned earlier on, so we're going to go into that now. Under the overall umbrella of Operation Bodyguard, the Allies conducted several 
uh, subsidiary operations designed to mislead the Germans uh, to the date of the location of Allied landings. Operation Fortitude included Fortitude North, a misinformation campaign using fake radio traffic to lead Germans into expecting the attack on Norway. The Fortitude South, a major deception involved the creation uh, the creation of fictitious 1st uh, United States Army Group under Lieutenant General George S. Patton, um, supposedly located in Kent and Sussex. Fortified South was intended to deceive the Germans into believing that the main attack would take place at Calais. Genuine radio messages from the 21st Army Group were first uh, routed to Kent via landline and then broadcast to give the Germans the impression that most of the Allied troops were stationed there. Patton was stationed in England until the 6th, uh, 6th of July, thus continuing to deceive the Germans into believing the second attack would take place at Calais. Many of the German radar stations in the French coast were destroyed in preparation for the landings. In addition, on the night before the, the invasion, a small group of Special Air Service SAS operators deployed dummy paratroopers over Le Havre and uh, in uh, Isigny. These dummies led the uh, Germans to believe that uh, an additional airborne landing had occurred on the same night in Operation Taxable, number 617 Squadron RAF convoy near Le Havre. The, um, the illusion was bolstered by a group of small uh, vessels towing barrage balloons. A similar deception was taken near uh, Bologna in the, in the Pas de Calais area by 218 Squadron RAF in Operation Glimmer. Now obviously the weather played a, a vital role in regards to getting uh, the Normandy beaches. Will Stalker, how are you doing? Um, let's see, we got Urban still, uh, Silver Stacking. Um, thanks very much guys for, for either listening to me, you're welcome to, you don't, there's nothing to essentially watch. I've got my, the World War II Zippo Lighter Commemorative, which we're gonna go through in a minute. But if you're listening, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for spending your time there. Um, so we're going to look at, obviously, weather played a major role. Um, the invasion planners determined a set of conditions involving the phase of the moons and tides. So obviously they made sure that they had a full understanding of exactly what was needed. So they this evening covered what the moon was going to be like, what the tides were going to be like at the time of day that would be satisfactory on only, the, only a few days to be te uh, in each month. The full moon was desirable as it would uh, provide illumination of aircraft pilots and have the highest tides. That's interesting. Um, ancient Nismatics, how are you doing? Got Limey in my latest vid. Yeah, I saw that. Thanks very much. Um, if you guys haven't checked out World, uh, World Stalker, he did a um, temple temple site. Um, and he did a video of it there. He obviously shouted me out as well. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to check him out. Um, let's see, where are we? Eisenhower, um, the Allies wanted to reschedule the landings for for shortly before dawn, midway between now and high tide. Um, with, with the tide coming in, this would improve the visibility of obstacles on the beach, while minimising the amount of time the men would be exposed in the open. Eisenhower had tentatively selected uh, 5 June as a date for the assault. However, on the 4th of June, conditions were unsuitable uh, for a landing. High high winds and heavy seas made it impossible to launch landing craft and low clouds would prevent aircraft from finding their targets. Um, just quickly here, can you guys all hear me okay? Just to make sure the um, sound quality is fine. Just let, let me know in the chat there. Uh, Group Captain James Stagg of the Royal Air Force and Eisenhower on the evening of the 4th of June. Super, thanks very much. Um, he had his meteorological team predicted the weather would improve enough the invasion to proceed on the 6th of June. The next available uh, dates obviously were 18th and the 20th. The postponement um, of the invasion would uh, would have conditions. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Eisenhower decided that the invasion would go ahead on the 6th. A major storm battered the Normandy coast uh, from the 19th to the 22nd of June, which would have made the beach landings impossible and probably further delayed. Um, Allied control of the Atlantic meant German meteorologists had less information about the Allies on incoming weather patterns. As the Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Palace was predicting two weeks of stormy weather, many Wehrmacht uh, commanders left their posts to attend war games in Rene. 
Um, the men in many units um, were given leave. Field Marshal Lewin Rodel returning to Germany for his wife's birthday and to meet uh, with Hitler to try and obtain more panzers. Well, we're going to go into the uh, order of battle in regards to the, the divisions, what the divisions were like um, in regards to the German side, and then we'll go into allies as well. Uh, so we're going to start off with the German order of battle. Um, Nazi Germany had, its, had at its disposable 50 divisions in France and the Low Countries. The Low Countries were considered Belgium, Netherlands, that, were, that is effectively the what they consider the Low Countries, with another 18 stationed in Denmark and Norway. 15 divisions were in the process of, of formation in Germany. Combat losses throughout the war, particularly on the Eastern Front, meant that the Germans no longer had the pool of able young men from which to draw. Uh, German, uh, German soldiers were now on average 60 years older, <laughs> sorry, six years older than the Allied uh, counterparts. Um, John RMS has got a question there. He says, um, Eisenhower picked the sixth and the fifth was picked by another meteorologist. Oh, okay, wow. Thanks very much, World Stalker. Appreciate it. You're welcome to drop in. I'm not sure how long I'll just stream until uh, um, I come to the end of this and then we'll have a look at uh, the goodies I have in front here. Um, many of the Normandy area um, was uh, the Eastern Legions, conscripts and volunteers from Russia, Mongolia and other, other areas of the Soviet Union. They were provided uh, They were provided mainly with unreliable captured equipment and lacked motorized transport. Many German units were under strength. The German Supreme Commander, Adolf Hitler. And then you've got the Supreme Commander West Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt. Uh, he was in charge of the uh, Panzer Group West. Uh, Army Group B was uh, commanded by Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. 7th Army, uh, you've got uh, General uh, Friedrich Dolmen. And then you've also got the another corps under General, looks like... Erich, um, Erich Marx on the uh, Contenton Peninsula which is where Sherborg is Allied forces attacking Utah Beach faced the following German unit stationed uh, the 709th Static Infantry Division under Karl Willem von Schleib Schleibern numbered 12,320 men many of them non-German conscripts recruited from uh, Soviet prisoners of war camps Ger uh, Georgians and Poles okay so that sounds like no wonder they sort of gave up quickly. Um, the 729th Gr uh, Gr uh, Grenada or Grenadier Regiment, the 739th uh, Gr uh, Grenadier Regiment, and the 919th Grenadier Regiment. So we've got six watching. Thanks very much uh, um, for watching, everybody. I'm just going through. This is just more a verbal. Um, you can technically call it a podcast um, if you wish. Um, so thanks very much for listening. The Grand Camps, um, the Americans assaulting Omar. Omar Beach faced the following troops 352nd Infantry Division under Dietrich uh, Kreis, a full strength unit of around 12,000 brought in by Rommel on the 15th of March and reinforced, reinforced by two additional regiments. Sorry, apologies for the uh, donkeys in the background there. Uh, the 914th Grenadier Regiment, the 915th Grenadier Regiment, uh, they were also classified as reserves. The 916th Grenadier Regiment, the 326th Infantry Regiment, um, and then the 352nd Artillery Regiment. The Allied forces at Gold and Juno faced the following elements. Um, so Gold and Juno would have been the Brits and the Canadians would have um, faced the following elements of the 352nd Infantry Division, which would have been the 914th Grenadier Regiment, the 915th Grenadier Regiment, uh, the 916th Grenadier Regiment and the 352nd Artillery Regiment. Uh, forces around uh, uh, Cannes. Allied forces attacking Gold, Juno and Sword Beaches faced the following German units. Off to work now. Thanks very much, Urban Silver. I appreciate you. You're more than welcome to play it in the car. But um, if, you, if you have the time, John RMS is still with us. Silver Husky, good morning to you. Welcome to this D-Day special. Uh, forces around uh, Cannes. So um, the Allied uh, forces attacking Gold, Juno and Sword Beaches uh, faced the 716th Static Inf Infantry Division by Wilhelm Richter. That's approximately 7,000 troops, which consisted of the 736th Infantry Regiment, the 
1716th Artillery Regiment, the 21st Panzer Division, um, under General Edgar Fucht Fuchtinger, um, included 146 tanks and 50 assault guns, plus supporting infantry and artillery. The 100th Panzer Regiment, uh, the 125th Panzer Gr uh, Grenadier Regiment, the 192nd uh, Gre uh, Panzer Grenadier Regiment, and the 155th Panzer Artillery Regiment. David Carlisle, we got Matteo De Fiore here from New York. Excellent, welcome. Thank you very much to this uh, for joining me on this D Day special. It's more of a podcast, really, but we'll. Uh, I've got a lovely uh, presentation box. Going to have a look at Sands of Normandy. Um, that's a uh, poke commemorative, but we'll uh, we'll take a look in a sec. Obviously, we'll move on to the Atlantic Wall. So obviously, Hitler wanted to devise a uh, defensive wall, pretty much on a, a, that went from the southernmost part of the west coast of France all the way up to Denmark and even up to Norway. Um, it was a it was a very interesting plan uh, which was only partially uh, partially finished. Um, okay so the Atlantic Wall, alarmed by the raids of Saint Nazaire and Deep in 1942, though those were unsuccessful landing attempts by the Allies, which is probably more like more like the Brits to, to set a beachhead. Uh, those were the earlier landings and they failed. Hitler had ordered the construction of the fortification all along the Atlantic coast from Spain to Norway to protect against the uh, the expected Allied invasion. So obviously he was he pretty much knew when, or it was more of the when and if um, there was going to be an Allied invasion. He, he envisaged 15,000 emplacements manned by 300,000 troops, uh, but shortages particularly on concrete manpower meant that most of the strong points were never built. Um, as it was expected to be a site of the invasion, uh, the Pas de Calais, was, uh, which is Calais in France, was heavily defended because obviously that was the shortest route uh, between Britain and France. And in, in the Normandy area, uh, best fortifications were concentrated at the port facilities at Cherbourg and St. Marlow. Um, um, Rommel was assigned to oversee the construction of further fortifications along the expected in, uh, invasion front, which stretched from the Netherlands to Cherbourg and was given command of a newly uh, formed Army Group B, which included the 7th Army, the 5th Army, and forces guarding the Netherlands. Uh, reserves for this uh, group included the 2nd, 21st, and 116th Panzer Division. So Panzers were, were motorised, so tanks um, tanks and motorised transport. Blazing Dube, how are you doing? Uh, just just got done uh, mowing the lawn. <laughs> wow, geez, you're up early. Uh, up early mowing the lawn that side. Fair play to you. So cheers, having myself a shot of wild turkey. Oh, lovely. I want to thank my American viewers. Um, again, this is a special day for, for the both of us, uh, being allies during the, the, the Normandy landings, and um, obviously likewise with the Canadians and everyone who took part in regards to the success of the Normandy landings. D-Day uh, D -Day was a collaboration of amazing and strong soldiers, absolutely, and a will. Um, sorry, apologies. The uh, donkeys are added there outside. Oh, right. <laughs> silver, silver taken off faces. Anyway, I'm going to just crack on with the... Um, so uh, Rommel believed that the Normandy coast uh, could be possible landing points for the invasion, so he ordered the construction of extensive defence works along that shore, in addition to concrete gun emplacements as strategic points along the coast. He ordered wooden stakes, metal tripods, mines, large anti-tank obstacles to be placed on the beaches to delay the approach of landing craft and impede the movement of tanks. Expecting the Allies to land at high tide so that the infantry could spend time ex exposed on the beach, he ordered that many of these obstacles to be placed at the high water mark. Uh, tangles of barbed wire, booby traps and the, re and the removal of ground cover on the approach to the hazardous would be hazardous for the infantry. On Rommel's order, a number of mines along the coast were, tri were tripled. Allied air defences over Germany had crippled the Luftwaffe, establishing air supremacy over Western Europe, because they'd obviously bombed a lot of the uh, the, the sub fuel supply dumps and the infrastructure um, airfields that they'd crippled their air superiority over Western Europe. And it was vital that um, that air superiority was in the hands of the Allies at that particular point. Um, Allied air defence over Germany had yeah, as crippled defence. So Rommel knew that uh, he could not expect effective air support. The Luftwaffe 
could muster only 815 aircraft. Over Normandy, in comparison to the Allies, 9,543 planes. So they had massive amounts of air power um, on on the day of uh, on on D-Day. Uh, Rommel arranged for the booby uh, trap stakes known as Rommel's uh, Spargel, Rommel's Asparagus, to be installed in meadows and fields to deter airborne landings. Wow, that's interesting. Never knew that. Armoured reserves. Rommel believed that the Germans' best chance uh, was to stop the invasion was at the shore. He requested that mobile reserves, especially tanks, be stationed uh, as close to the coast as possible. Rundstedt, Geyer and other senior commanders objected. They believed that the invasion could not be stopped on the beaches. Uh, Geyer argued for the conventional doctrine, keeping the panzer formations concentrated in a central position around Paris and Rouen and deploying them uh, when the main Allied beach had, had been identified. He also noted that in the Italian campaign, the armoured units uh, stationed near the coast um, had been damaged by naval bombardments. Rommel's opinion was that because of the Allied air supremacy, the large-scale movement of tanks could, could not be possible once the invasion was underway. And then again, that is why they were, they were grossly outnumbered, 8 to 1, uh, aircraft-wise, and um, it was a bit of it was like a turkey shoot. Uh, once obviously the uh, once the Germans had mobilised their their their, t their panzers to go forward um, to go and attack those beachheads, they were picked off by uh, by anti anti tank aircraft. Um, a large scale movements for hence why the large scale movements would not be possible. Hitler made the final final decision, which which was to leave three panzer divisions under Geer's command and give Rommel operation control of three more as reserves. Hitler took personal control of four divisions as strategic reserves, not to be used without his direct orders. Right, now we move on to the Allied order of battle. So we look at the various divisions that the Allied troops had. Silver Husky says USMC, United States Marine Corps, Huey Cobra Squadron. Wow. Right, so the Allied order of battle, so Commander-in-Chief uh, General Dwe uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower and uh, 21st Army Group was uh, led by General Bernard Montgomery. Um, U.S. Zones, Commander, 1st Army, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley. The 1st Army contingent totaled approximately 73,000 men. Uh, just that one army contingent outnumbered the Germans uh, total just on the... Uh, on the Normandy front. Um, including 15,600 from the airborne, airborne divisions. Utah Beach, 7th Corps, commanded by Major General uh, Lawton Collins. Uh, 4th Infantry Division, Major General Raymond Barton. 82nd Airborne, uh, airborne Division, Major General Matthew uh, Ridgway. 90th Infantry Division, Brigadier General J.W. Uh, McKelvey. 101st Airborne Division, Major General Maxwell D. Taylor. Looks like sounds from Normandy. It certainly does. <laughs> I'll be, uh, I'll, we'll be having a look at this. I haven't actually opened up. I've had this for in my possession for the last 15 years, and I've never opened this book. So I'm going to open the book today. We're going to take a look at the images in here. I've got no idea what is inside there, so uh, it'll be great to see. And to share with you guys what's in there, and we'll have a look at the at the Zippo lighters. Um, I used to collect Zippo lighters, um, and I've got some World War Two lighters. Unfortunately, they're not with me; they're in a different country. My stepfather's looking after them there. I've got some of the original Black Crackle, uh, which were issued to the GIs during the war. Um, so I've got one of them left. I had three. I sold off to. Uh, but it's an interesting, interesting story. I'll go over that later. So if you guys are still in there, um, in later after I finish going through this. Um, I'll gladly discuss that with you. Old lighters are very cool, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the. Um, I do have the the original black crackle finish lighter from the nineteen forties, um, but it's it's not here. But I'll sh I'll show you the subtle differences in between this this replica here, which is issued by uh, Zippo. Right, Omaha Beach. We've got Fifth Corps, commanded by General Leonard uh, T. Gurro, commanding thirty four thousand two hundred and fifty men. 1st Division, Major General Clarence uh, Hubner. 29th Infantry, Infantry Division was by Major General Charles H. Gerrard. The British and Canadian zones. So I just realised I need to get something to drink. All 
Right, the British and Canadian zones. Commander, Second Army, Britain and Canada, Lieutenant General Sir Miles Dempsey. Overall, the Second Army contingent consisted of 83,115 men, 61,715 of them British. Normally, British air and naval support units included a large number of personnel from Allied nations, including several RAF squadrons, almost exclusively by overseas aircrew. For example, the Australian contribution to the operation included regular Royal Australian Air Force Squadron, 9th Article 15 Squadron. Hundreds of personnel posted to RAF units and RN warships, Royal, and that means Royal Navy. The RAF supplied two-thirds of the aircraft involved in the invasion. So just checking the chat here. I'm envious um, and love that. Uh, as you know, uh, just lost my uncle, World War II veteran. I'm sorry uh, I'm sorry to hear that, um, John RMS. Uh, Any, I think uh, I take my hand off to anybody who served in, uh, in, 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 that, um, in, in that war. Uh, my condolences uh, there, John RMS. Um, okay, so we've got uh, a breakdown of the of forces Gold Beach. Um, so we've got 30th Corps, commanded by Lieutenant General Gerard uh, Bucknell, 50th Northumbrian Infantry Division, Major General DAA, sorry D A H Graham, on Juno Beach. Uh, we've got the British First Corps, commanded by Lieutenant General John Croker, Third Division uh, Canadian Division, Major General Rod Kula. Uh, Swords Beach, we've got British First Corps, commanded by General John Crocker. Third Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Tom Renning. Uh, Sixth Airborne Division, Major General R.N. Gale. The 79th Armoured Division, Major General Percy Hobart, provided specialist army armoured vehicles which supported the landings on um, all beaches um, on the Second Army sector. And they were known as Har Harbert's, um, Hobart's, um, I mentioned it earlier on, Hobart's um, Funnies. Hobart's Funnies were a specialised tank that they, uh, that they used. Um, obviously, during for the success of the Normandy Langes, the, uh, the Allies, um, no problem, Silver Husky, thanks very much. Thanks for the education and have an awesome day. You too, thanks very much for sticking it through. Coin Collector's here. Hey, Coin Collector, welcome. Welcome to the D-Day special. Uh, are you welcome to check the playback? I'm going through pretty much the preparations through to the uh, D-Day Normandy landings, and we're going to take a look at some other stuff there. I mean, it's all, all okay. I did a couple of videos a few weeks ago. Uh, I was choked up at the time. Uh, now I'm good. Okay, cool, man. Well, look, um, my condolences for you there, though, John RMS. Um, so the Allies uh, coordinated with French resistance, um, so we're going to go into that area now. So uh, through the London-based uh, French forces of the interior, obviously because um, obviously the, the 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 Free French is what they were called. So you had Vichy uh, Vichy French, which which had sided with uh, with Germany, um, and then you've got the Free French forces led by uh, General Charles de Gaulle. So obviously they couldn't operate out of France. So obviously they operated out of Britain. Um, uh, they'd implemented um, so the operations executive orchestrated campaign of sabotage implemented by the French resistance. The Allies developed four plans for the resistance to execute on D-Day. Plan Vert was a 15-day operation to sabotage the rail system. Plan Bleu dealt with destroying electrical facilities. Plan Tortue was a delaying operation aimed at enemy forces that would potentially reinforce Axis forces at Normandy. Plan Violet dealt with the cutting of underground telephone and uh, teleprinter cables. Love the pronunciation. <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Uh, the resistance was alerted to carry out uh, these tasks by messages personnel tra transmitted by the BBC French service um, from London. Uh, several hundred of these messages, which might be uh, snatches of poetry, quotations from uh, literature or random sentences, were regularly transmitted, masking the few that were actually significant. So obviously they're just blanketed a whole bunch of transmissions and obviously a few of them were the ones that actually had the correct orders. In the weeks preceding to the landings, a list of messages and their meanings were distributed to the resistance groups. An increase in radioactivity on the 5th of June uh, was correctly interpreted by the German intelligence to mean that the invasion was imminent or underway. 
However, because of the barrage of the previous false warnings and misinformation, most units ignored the warning. Bad for them. <laughs> in uh, a 1965 report from the Counterinsurgency Information Analysis Centre detailed the results of the French resistance sabotage efforts. In the southeast, 52 locomotives were destroyed on the 6th of June, uh, and the railway line cut uh, in more than 500 places. Normandy was isolated as of the 7th of June. But we obviously had a substantial amount of naval forces uh, for the preparation as well, so we're going to go into that. Um, and then we've also got bombardments, um, airborne operations as well, so uh, we'll keep going. I um, hope you guys are all well out there. Th again, thanks very much for joining this uh, Technia a podcast. We're going to go through a lot here, so um, I'll try not to keep you guys too long, but you're more than welcome to play me in the background. There's nothing effectively to see, uh, but I will be showing you the Zippo lighter, but I will state that uh, once we're finished talking that through. I hope you're all well out there. So we uh, move on to naval. Naval operations for the invasion were described uh, by historian Corelli Barnett as a, a never surpassed masterpiece of planning. Um, in overall command um, was the British Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, who had served as flag officer at Dover during the, uh, the Dunkirk um, evacu evacuation four years earlier. So for those, the British Expeditionary Force during uh, the, when um, Germany went through the Low Countries, uh, they sent an expeditionary force that met in, in Belgium. And then, of course, you had the Germans attacking through the Ardennes, which surprised everybody because initially the Ardennes, they thought, was impenetrable. Uh, and as effectively, the, the, the panzers were swinging towards the coast, which would have cut off that entire army. So uh, the, um, the Dunkirk uh, operation successfully... Uh, um, Sorry, successfully um, got about three hundred thousand troops apparently back to the uh, back to Britain before the Germans closed in. Um, in one of the two fleets carrying troops for the invasion of Sicily the following year, the invasion fleet, which was drawn from eight different uh, navies, comprised six thousand nine hundred and thirty-nine vessels, um, one thousand two hundred and thirteen warships. 4,126 landing craft. So obviously the landing craft, they were just dropping guys off, going back, picking guys up, dropping guys off. I mean, it must be one heck of an operation. Um, 736 ancillary craft and 864 merchant vessels. So I saw someone there. Uh, um, have you read some of Corelli Barnett's books? Uh, unfortunately not. I haven't actually read them there, uh, Coin Collector. Lie me and all, remember and never forget, I send my love to everyone. I must go, but I stayed for 45 minutes. I know, I really appreciate it. John RMS, thanks, buddy. Have, have yourself a great day. If I'm still on, drop in later. I really appreciate anyone who's listening. Uh, if you want to drop in, just put a kind word in and um, head out to your uh, usual day duties, or you can listen uh, You can listen on uh, while you're driving. But yeah, really, thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, so, uh, what's that? The invasion fleets, okay, there we go, went through that. Majority of the fleet was supplied by the UK, which provided 892 warships, 3,000 landing craft. Um, in a total, there was 195,700 naval personnel involved, of which 112,000 were of, of the Royal Navy, with another 25,000 from the Merchant Navy. My grandfather actually served in the, in the Merchant Navy, um, obviously, but um, he uh, that was later on. 52,889 were uh, were American, and 4,998 sailors were from Allied countries. The invasion fleet was split into the Western Naval Task Force under Admiral Alan G. Kirk, supporting the U.S. sectors, and the Eastern Naval Task Force under Admiral Sir Philip uh, Vian, the British and Canadian. Uh, he obviously uh, was supporting the British and naval sectors. My gra wow, check that out, Blazing Dude. My grandpa was in World War II, but not sure if he was in Normandy. That's awesome, Blazing Dude. Do you, have, do you still have some of his um, memorabilia? He was stationed in Germany for sure. Cool, man. Uh, the, inv the invasion fleets, okay, yeah, we got app available to the fleet were five battleships, 20 cruisers, 65 destroyers, and two monitors. German ships in the area on D Day included three torpedo boats. 25 fast attack craft, 36 R boats, 36 minesweepers, patrol boats. So they didn't really have much of a naval force. 
um, except for U-boats, but the, even that um, didn't have that many. The, the Germans also had several U-boats available, and all of the approaches had been heavily mined. There we go. So eight uh, naval losses. So at uh, ten past five, four German torpedo boats reached the Eastern Task Force and launched 15 torpedoes, sinking the Norwegian destroyer HNOMS uh, um, Svenne off Sword Beach by missing the battleship HMS Warspite and Ramleys. Um, after attacking the German vessels, turned away and fled east into the into a smoke screen which had been laid by the RAF to shield uh, the fleet from long-range uh, battery um, at, Le, at Le Havre. Allied losses to mines include the American destroyer USS Corey of Utah and the submarine chaser USS PC-1261, a 173rd foot patrol craft, in addition to many landing craft were lost. So my, uh, my thoughts go with those men. Um, bombardments, uh, bombing uh, of Normandy, Says he's got an acoustic guitar, uh, not too much else. Go Washington Pay Dirt, how are you doing? Thanks very much for joining this D-Day special. I hope you're having a fantastic day where you are, my friend. Uh, the bombing of Normandy began around midnight uh, with more than 2,200 British and Canadian and the US bombers um, attacked targets along the coast and further inland. The coastal bombing attacks were largely ineffective at Omaha uh, because low cloud cover made the assigned targets difficult to see. Concerned about the inflicting casualties of their own troops, many bombers delayed their attacks too long and failed to hit the beaches, the beach defences. So obviously the majority of the beach defences were still intact. The Germans had eight 570 aircraft stationed in Normandy and the Low Countries on D-Day, and another 964 in Germany. Minesweepers began clearing channels for the invasion f uh, fleet, uh, shortly after midnight and finished just um, just after dawn without encountering the enemy. The Western Task Force included battleships Arkansas, Nevada and Texas, plus eight cruisers, 28 destroyers and one monitor. The Eastern Task Force included the battleships Ramleys, the Warspite and the monitor uh, Roberts. 12 cruisers and 37 destroyers. Naval bombardments of the area uh, on the beach began commenced at 5.45, so that was just before the official landings. Uh, while still dark, with the gunners switching to pre-assigned targets on the beach as soon as uh, they were lit, and, uh, lit up enough at 5.50. Go Washington Peter, thanks very much, I'll check that out. Uh, since tro troops were scheduled to land at Utah and Omar starting at 6.30, an hour earlier, these uh, areas received only about 40 minutes of naval bomb bombardments before the assault um, troops began to land on the shore for a sec guys right let me start to look at the um, at airborne operations so we're going to take a look at the success of the amphibious landings uh, depended on the establishment of the secure lodgements to expand the beachhead to allow build-up of well-supplied forces capable of breaking out. Um, the amphibious forces were especially vulnerable to strong enemy counter-attacks uh, before the arrival of sufficient forces on the beachheads. The US 82nd and 101st Divisions were assigned to, uh, to objectives west of, of Utah Beach, where they'd hoped to capture and control few narrow causeways through terrain that had um, that had been intentionally flooded by the Germans. The reports from Allied intelligence on mid-May, the arrival of the German 91st Infantry Division, meant the intended drop zone had to be shifted, because obviously there was too, too much of a concentration of uh, enemy um, enemy forces at the de designated areas. The British 6th Airborne Division on the eastern flank was assigned to capture the intact bridges over Cannes, uh, the Cannes Canal and the River Orne. Destroying five bridges over the dives uh, six miles to the east and destroyed the Merville gun battery overlooking Sword Beach. Obviously, you can still see the Merville gun batteries today um, if you were to go there. Be, has anyone been to Normandy? Just out of interest. 
The three French paratroopers from the British SAS Brigade were assigned to ob objectives in Brittany from the 5th of June until August in Operation uh, Ding Dingson, Sam West and Cooney. The BBC war correspondent Robert Barr describes the scene as the paratroopers uh, prepare to board their craft. Their faces were darkened uh, with cocoa. Uh, sheathed knives were strapped to their ankles. Tommy guns strapped to their waists, bandoliers and hand grenades, coils of ropes, pick handles, spades, rubber dinghies hung around them and a few pers uh, personnel oddments. Uh, like like the like the lad who was to, who was taking a newspaper to read on the plane there was a, a, an easy familiar touch about the way that they were getting ready as though they had done it often before <laughs> so it sounds like the guys were predominantly relaxed um well um well yes they had kitted up and climbed aboard just um just like this 20 30 40 times um some of them and had never been quite like this before this was the first combat jump for every one of them. Right, then we're going to look at the US Airborne Forces. Uh, so US Airborne landings began at the arrival of the Pathfinders at quarter past 12 uh, just after after midnight navigation was difficult because of the of the uh, there was a thick blanket of cloud um which obviously um at this as the result was one of the five par paratrooper zones was accurately marked with radar signals and oldest lamps paratroopers of the u.s 82nd and 101st airborne divisions numbering over 13,000 men were delivered by douglas c-47s sky trains and uh, uh, nine troop carrier command uh, to avoid flying over the invasion fleet, the planes uh, arrived from the west over the Cottonton Peninsula and exited over Utah Beach. So the, that would have been over Sherbrooke that would have come in through that area. The paratroopers from the 101st uh, Airborne were dropped beginning at 1.30 a.m., tasked with controlling the causeway behind Utah Beach and destroying road and rail bridges over the, over the Dove River. The C-47s could not fly in tight formations because of the thick cloud, and many paradrops uh, were dropped far from their intended landing zones. Many many planes came in uh, so low that they were under fire from both flak and machine gun fire. Some paratroopers were killed on impact when the when the parachutes uh, did not have time to open. Others drowned in in, in flooded fields. <clears throat> the gathering together into fighting units was made difficult by the shortages of radios and uh, bouquet terrain with its hedge, hedgerows, stone walls and marshes. Some units did not arrive at their intended uh, targets until the afternoon, by which time several of the causeways had already been cleared by members of the 4th Infantry Division uh, moved up from the beaches. <clears throat> Sorry guys, thanks for listening there. <laughs> Uh, troops of the sec the the eighty second airborne uh, began arriving at two thirty, uh, with the primary objective of capturing two bridges over the river, uh, Marderet, uh, and destroying two bridges over the Dove. On the east side of the river, seventy five percent of the paratroopers landed in or near their drop zone, and within two hours they captured the important crossroad of Saint Marie uh, Eglise, the first town liberated in the invasion. And, um, and began working to protect the western flanks. Because of the capture of the Pathfinders uh, to accurately mark the drop zone, the two regiments dropped on the west side of the, the Maradet were extremely scattered. Um, many landed in nearby swamps with much blocks of life. Shame. Uh, paratroopers consolidated into small groups Usually a combination of men with various ranks from different units attempted to concentrate on nearby objectives. So there were a lot of um, men from various divisions that teamed up together. Um, they captured but failed uh, to hold the Maradet River Bridge and fighting there for the crossing continued for several days. Reinforcements arrived by glider at around four in the morning. Mission Chicago and Mission uh, Detroit uh, at 2100 hours. Mission uh, Co 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 Cook 
uh, mission uh, El, El Marina, bringing additional troops and heavy equipment. Like the paratroopers, many landed far from their drop zones. Even those that had landed on targets experienced difficulties with heavy cargo such as jeeps shifting uh, during landing, crashing through wooden fuselages, and in some case, crushing personnel on board. Jeez. Okay. Um, after 24 hours, only 2,500 men of the 101st and 2,000 of the 82nd Airborne um, were under control of their divisions. Approximately a third of the forces dropped. This wide dispersed, um, this wide dispersal had an effect of confusing the Germans, uh, fragmenting their response. The Seventh Army received notifications of the parachute drops at, at 120, but Rundstedt did not initially believe that a, a major invasion was underway. The destruction of radar stations along the Normandy coast in the weeks before the invasion meant the Germans did not detect the approaching fleet until two in the morning. Um, any uh, any questions there or mentions? Just going through the... Uh, I've still got five watching, so guys, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to listen here. But then we move on to British and um, Canadian. Operation Tonga. The first Allied action of D-Day was Operation Deadstick. Um, a glider assault at 16 past 12 on the Pegasus Bridge over the Cannes Canal and the bridge um, over the Orne. Uh, that was renamed Horsa Bridge. Uh, 800 metres to the east. Um, both bridges were quickly captured intact with light casualties by, by members of the 5th Parachute Brigade and the 7th Light Infantry Parachute Battalion. The five bridges over the dives uh, were destroyed with minimal difficulty by the 3rd Parachute Brigade. Meanwhile, the Pathfinders, tasked with setting up the radar beacons and lights for the paratroopers, uh, scheduled to begin arriving at 10 to 1. To clear the landing zones north of the Ramble were blown off course. Uh, many paratroopers uh, were also blown too far east and landed far from their intended drop zones and took many hours to be reunited with their own units. Um, Major General Richard Gale arrived in a third wave of gliders at 3.30 uh, along with equipment such as anti-tank guns and jeeps with more troops to help secure the area from counter-attacks which were initially staged only by troops in the immediate vicinity of the landings. Um, at 2 a.m. Uh, 2 the commander of the German 716th ordered a... ordered Fucht, Fuchtunga to move his 21st Division, uh, Panzer Division, into position to counterattack. However, um, as the division was part of the armoured reserve, Fuchtunga was obliged to seek clearance from OKW before he could OKW? Let's have a look. Who's OKW? Oh, the uh, high commander of the Wehrmacht. Uh, before he could commit his formation. Fuchtinger did not receive orders until nearly 9am in the morning. But in the meantime, on his own initiative, he put together a small group, including tanks, to fight the British forces east of the Yorn. Only 160 men out of 600 members of the 9th Battalion tasked with eliminating the enemy battery at Merville arrived at the rendezvous point. Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway was in charge of operations, decided to proceed regardless, as the emplacement uh, had to be destroyed by 6 to prevent it from firing on the invasion fleet and troops arriving on Sword Beach. In the Battle of Merville gun, uh, gun battery, Allied forces disabled the gun with, a, with plastic explosives at the cost of 75 casualties. Um, the emplacement was found to contain 75mm guns rather than the expected 150mm um, heavy artillery coastal guns. Otway's remaining force withdrew the, uh, with the assistance of a few members of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. While this action, the, the last of D-Day goals of the British 6th Airborne was achieved, they were only reinforced by 12 o'clock by commandos and the 1st Special Service Brigade who landed on Sword Beach and by the 6th Air Landing Division, um, who arrived upon gliders at, 19, at 2100 hours. The beach landings, so we move on to the various beach landings. Um, right, beach landings. Hope you guys are all having a great day out there. Again, I've still got five watching, so guys, thanks very much for listening.
Um, obviously, I hope you guys find it very interesting. All right, so we got tanks. Some of the landing craft have been modified uh, to provide close support fire and such propelled amphibious duplex drive tanks, DD tanks, where they became known as. Sweet, I, I will get you right back, my friend. You got a sub? Oh, awesome. Silver Stanger, how are you doing, buddy? Thanks very much. Thanks very much for stopping in. It's great to have um it's great it's great to have you here, my uh, my friend. Um so the DD tanks were specially designed for the Normandy landings, were to land shortly before infantry to provide covery fire. However, few arrived in advance of the infantry, and many sank while reaching the shore, especially at Omaha. Um Utah Beach. Utah was the area defended by the second by two battalions of the nine 119th Grenadier, uh, Grenadier Regiment. Members of the 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division were the first to land, arriving at 6.30 a.m. Um, Their landing craft were pushed to the south by strong currents and they found themselves about 2,000 yards, so about 1.8 kilometers from their intended landing zone. This site turned out to be better as there was only, a, only, there were, as there was only one strong point rather than, uh, than the nearby two. And bombers of the 9th Bomber Command had bombed the defences from the lower than uh, had prescribed altitude, inflicting considerable damage. In addition, the strong currents had washed ashore many of the um, underwater obstacles. Um, the Assistant Commander of the 4th Division, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the first senior officer ashore, made the decision to start uh, the war from right here and ordered further landings to be rerouted. Uh, I'm I'm doing quite well, thank you very much, um, Silver Stanger. Um, I thought I'd just do a DD um, um, special today, obviously with the commemoration of the 75th anniversary. Um, so I'll go through exactly what happened, and then we'll have a look at some stuff here. <laughs> right. Um, the initial assault battalion was quickly followed by 28 DD tanks and several waves of engineers and demolition teams to remove beach obstacles and clear the area directly behind the beach. Um, of obstacles and mines. Gaps were blown in the area wall to allow quicker access for troops and tanks. Combat teams began to exit the beach at about 9am and some inf infantry wading through the flooded fe uh, fields rather than travelling on the single road. Um, they skirmished throughout the day with the elements of the 919th uh, Grenadier Regiment who were armed with anti-tank guns and rifles. Uh, many strong points in the area and other 1,300 yards to the south were disabled by noon. The 4th Infantry Division did not meet all of their D-Day objectives at Utah, Utah Beach, partly because they had arrived too far south, but they landed 21,000 troops at the cost of only 197 casualties. Wow, that's pretty low. Um, we're going to move on to Omaha Beach. Omaha, the most heavily defended beach, was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division of the 29th Infantry Division. They faced the 352nd Infantry Division rather than the expected single Infantry Division. Sorry, I'm going to go through this now. Uh, the strong currents, um, the strong currents forced many landing craft east, east, uh, east of their intended positions, causing them to be delayed. For the fear of hitting the landing craft, U.S. bombers were delayed, uh, which we went through earlier. The U.S. bombers uh, delayed recent their loads, and as a result, most of the beach obstacles at Omaha Beach remained undamaged when the men came ashore. Many of the landing craft ran aground on sandbars, and men had to wade 50 to 100 meters. In, in water up to their necks while under fire to get to the beach. In spite of the rough seas, DD tanks of the of the two companies of the 741st Tank Battalion were dropped 5,000 yards from shore. That's 4,600 metres. However, 27 of the 32 flooded and sank, wow, with the loss of 33 crew. Some tanks disabled on the beach continued to provide covery fire until their ammunition ran out. 
or they were swamped by rising tides, while well, brave men. Cavaliers were around 2,000 as the men was, were subjected to fire from the cliffs. Problems clearing the beach of the obstructions led to the, uh, the beach master calling a halt to further landings of vehicles at 8.30. A group of destroyers arriving uh, around the time provided fire support so landings could resume. Um, exit from the beach was possible only via, uh, via five heavily defended gullies and by late morning barely 600 men had reached the higher ground. By noon, as artillery fire took its toll on the Germans started to run out of ammunition. The Americans were able to clear some lanes in the beaches. They also started to clear the gullies and enemy defences so the vehicles could move off uh, the beach. Tenius uh, beachhead uh, was expanded over the following days and the DJ objectives for Omaha were accomplished by D-Day plus three. So when they refer to plus D-Day, so it's D-Day today and then it was plus one, plus two, plus three as the D-Day, uh, as the days rolled on. Um, so yesterday they had the pre-celebration so it would have been called D-Day minus one. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, just a brief bit on that. So we've got Gold Beach and Juno Beach next. So moving on to Gold Beach. The first landings um, on Gold Beach were set for uh, 7.25 due to the differences in the tide between their and the US beaches. The high winds made conditions uh, difficult for the landing craft. Um, and the amphibious D-Day uh, DD tanks uh, were released close to shore or directly on the beach instead of further out as planned. Three of the four guns in the large emplacements along the uh, Lugesimur battery were disabled by direct hits from cruisers IX and Argonaut at 20 past six. The fourth gun uh, resumed fire firing intermittently in the afternoon and its garrison surrendered on the 7th of June. Aerial attacks had failed to hit uh, uh, La Hummel strong points, which had its um, embrasure facing east to provide fire along the beach and a thick concrete wall on the seaside. Its 75 millimeter gun continued to do damage until four, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon when a modified armored vehicle Royal Engineers tank fired a large uh, petard charge into its rear entrance. The second case, uh, uh, casemated emplacement at Le, Le, Rivi Le, Le Riviere containing an 88 mm gun was neutralized by a tank by 7.30. Meanwhile, infantry began clearing the heavily fortified houses along the shore and advanced on targets further inland. The number 47 Royal Marine Commando moved towards the small port at Port N. Bassin and captured it in the following day at the Battle of Port uh, N. Bassin. Company Sergeant Major Stanley Hollis received the, uh, the only Victoria Cross awarded on D-Day for this action while attacking two pillboxes at the Mont excuse me, the Montfleuret High Point on the western flank. Um, Hampshire Regiment captured um, Ar Aramanches, uh, future site Mulberry B. Contact uh, was made on the eastern flank with Canadian forces at Juneau. The Boy X uh, was not captured uh, the first day due to stiff resistance from the 352nd Infantry Division. Allied casualties at Gold Beach were estimated at 1,000. David, um, and then at this time, Hobart's Funnies were able to do their job. Yeah, that is that is correct. Hobart's Funnies. Um, I, I, I did mention that earlier on. That's pretty cool. Uh, Juno Beach. Uh, so that is the, I think it's the Canadians. Uh, I think Juno was the Canadians. I'm going to just check that out before I continue here. Okay. Uh, the landing at Juno was delayed because of choppy seas and the men arrived ahead of the supporting armour, suffering many casualties. While disembarking, most of the offshore bombardments had missed the German defences. Several exits from the beach were created, but not without difficulty. Um, at Mike Beach on the western flank, a large crater was filled using an abandoned AVRE tank. Um, several rolls of, of uh, is it Fascine? which were covered by a temporary bridge. Let me just find out what that is. A fascine is a rough bundle of brushwood or other materials used to strengthen an earthen structure. So they're built like a fortification. 
Um, the tank remained in place until 1972. So they left the tank there on the beach. <laughs> How cool is that? When it was removed and restored by the members of the Royal Engineers. The beach and nearby streets were clogged with traffic for most of the day, making it difficult to move inland. Major German strong points with 75mm guns and machine gun nests and concrete fortifications by iron mines were located at the, uh, uh, the Casella sur uh, Saint Urbain sur Mer, uh, the Brunei sur Mer. <laughs> Don't ask me if I actually got that right, but um, it certainly sounded like it. The towns themselves um, also had to be cleared in the house to house fighting. The soldiers on the way to Beni sur Mer, three miles inland, discovered that the road was well covered by machine gun emplacements uh, that had to be outflanked before advancing uh, could proceed. Elf Babe, how are you? Uh, it's good to see you. Thank you very much for joining. Well, if you're stopping in briefly, this is just a D-Day special um, for those uh, the Allies uh, the Allies landing at, uh, at Normandy. Um, uh, once I finish the, uh, the basic overview, I'm going to go in and show you these things here. Uh, the major German strong points for, with 75mm guns, machine gun nests, concrete fortifications, barbed wires. Um, the elements of the 9th Canadian Infantry Brigade. <coughs> oh, oh, excuse me. Uh, the elements of the 9th uh, Canadian Infantry Brigade advanced with the sights of the airfield in late in the afternoon. But by this time their supporting armour was low on ammunition, so the Canadians dug in for the night. The airfield was not captured until a month later as the area became the scene of fierce fighting. So obviously there must have been a considerable amount of reinforcements coming in. By nightfall, the continuous... Uh, the contiguous Juno and Gold beachheads covered 12 miles wide um, and 7 miles deep. Casualties of Juno with 961 men. Swords Beach. So we move on to swords now. On sword... 21 out of 25 DD tanks, of which the first wave was successful in getting safely ashore to provide cover for the infantry, who began disembarking at 7.30 a.m. The beaches were heavily mined and peppered with obstacles, making the work of the beach clearing teams difficult and dangerous. In the windy conditions, the tide came in more quickly than expected, so manoeuvring the armour was difficult. The beach quickly became congested, Brigadier Simon Fraser, 15th Lord uh, Lovat, and his first Special Service Brigade um, arrived in the second wave, uh, piped ashore by Private Bill Marlins, Lovat's personal piper. Um, so that's the that would have been the uh, the bag the bagpipes. Um, members of the Number Four Commando moved through uh, Ost Ost Ostrinham to attack from the rear. A gun battery on the shore. The French forces under Commander uh, Philippe Kiver, uh, the first French soldiers to arrive in Normandy, attacked and, and cleared the heavily fortified strong points at Casino at uh, Riva Bella uh, with the aid of one of the DD, uh, the DD tanks. Morris, the strong point near uh, Colville, was captured after about an hour of fighting. The nearby Hillman strong point. Headquarters of the 736th Infantry Regiment was a large complex uh, defensive work that had come through the morning bombardment. Essentially undamaged, it, 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 had, it had not captured. It was, it was not captured until uh, quarter past eight of that evening. The 2nd Battalion, King's Shropshire Light Infantry, was advancing to, uh, to Cannes on foot, coming within a few kilometres of the town, but had to withdraw due to lack of armour support. At four in the afternoon, the 21st Panzer Division mounted a counterattack from Swords and Juno, nearly succeeding to reach the channel. It met stiff resistance from the British 3rd Division, which had soon recalled to assist the area uh, between Cannes and uh, uh, Boyex. Uh, estimates of Allied casualties on Sword Beach are as high as a 1,000. We'll then go into uh, the aftermath. The Normandy landings were the largest seaborne invasion in history, with nearly 5,000 landings and aircraft, 289 escort vessels and 277 minesweeper participating. Nearly 160,000 troops crossed the English Channel on D-Day, with 875,000 men disembarking on the end uh, by the end of June. 
Allied casualties on the first day were at least 10,000, so 10,000 casualties, with 4,414 confirmed dead. The Germans lost 1,000 men, and the Allied invasion plan had, had, had called for the capture of Carantan and Cannes and sent low and the and Boyex on the first day with all the beaches linked with the front line 10 to 16 kilometers uh, from the beach none of these objectives were achieved the first beachheads were not connected until the 12th of June um, by which the Allies held the front held the front around 97 kilometers and 24 kilometers deep uh, can a major obstacle uh, was still in German hands by the end of D-Day and would not be completely captured until the 21st of July. The Germans had ordered the French civilians, other than those deemed essential to the war effort, to leave potential combat zones in Normandy and civilian casualties on D-Day and D-Day plus one were estimated at 3,000. So a lot of people, unfortunately, civilians lost their lives. Um, Health Babe says, thanks for your D-Day tribute and the sacrifices. Absolutely. Um, my heart's gone out to those family members that lost, uh, well, that lost family during during the war, whether it be civilian or men in service. Um, and even for those that have served in con consecutive wars since. But uh, thanks for leaving your comment there, Health Babe. Victory in Normandy stemmed by, from several factors. German preparations along the Atlantic War were only partially finished. Shortly before D-Day, uh, Rommel reported that construction was only 18% complete in some areas, as resources were diverted elsewhere. The deceptions undertaken in Operation Fortitude were successful, leaving the, the Germans obliged to defend a huge stretch of coastline. Uh, the Allies achieved and maintained air supremacy, which meant that the Germans were unable to make observations of the preparations underway in Britain, and were unable to interfere, um, in interfere via bomber attacks. The infrastructure for transport in France was severely disrupted by the Allied bombers and the French resistance, making it difficult for the, German, the Germans to bring up reinforcements and supplies. Some of the um, opening bombardments were off target or not concentrated enough to have an impact. But for the specialised armour worked well, um, with, well with the except on Omaha, providing much close artillery support for the troops as they disembarked into, onto the beaches. The indecisiveness and overlay complicated command structure on part of the German High Command were also factors in the Allied success. A lot, a lot of people tend to say if Rommel had, had placed his panzers close to the shoreline, then the, probably the success would have been reduced of the Normandy invasion, because obviously then the armoured units would have been right there, as opposed to being as far back as Paris, and then of course having the, the long run to get to get to the beaches so a lot of people are, to this day just, uh, are talking about that potential that Rommel if Rommel had got his way and had those panzer units closer to the coast uh, what an effect that would have had on the on the Normandy landings um obviously war memorials we've got cemeteries we've got the uh, German war cemetery at Boyex and uh, the Canadian war cemetery there at Benny sur um at Omaha Beach parts of the Mulberry Harbour are still visible and a few of the beach obstacles remain. A memorial to the US National Guard uh, sits at the location of a former German strong point. Point de Hoc is little changed from 1944, with terrain covered with bomb craters and most of the concrete bunkers still in place. The Normandy American Cemetery Memorial is nearby. In Colville Simir, a museum about the Utah landings is located at Saint uh, Marie de Mont. There is one dedicated to the activities of the U.S. airmen at St. Mir Inglise. Two German military cemeteries are located nearby. Pegasus Bridge, a target of the British 6th Airborne, was the site of some early action of the Normandy landings. The bridge was replaced in 1944 by one similar in appearance, and the original is now housed on the grounds of a nearby museum complex. Sections of the Mulberry Harbour are uh, are still in the area as the uh, Aram Manches and well-preserved uh, battery, the, the longest um, uh, battery is nearby. Juno Beach Centre opened in 2003, so they've obviously opened up a bit of a tourist centre there, and was funded by the Canadian Federal and Provincial Governments, uh, France and Canadian Veterans. Obviously they've made numerous uh, numerous movies, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, 
the Band of Brothers, um, which I, I, I think I actually have somewhere. Um, and then obviously they've done a, a numerous amounts of video games in regards to the World War Two. You've obviously got The Longest Day there by Cornelius Ryan, and they made that into a movie. And apparently there's talk of them doing a doing a modern uptake in regards to The Longest Day. So that was an aspect of all all sides of the war. Um, and you've got D-Day, The Battle of Normandy by Anthony uh, Beaver in 2009. Yeah, it was the darkest day of history. There we go. I watched the whole series, Band of Brothers. Yeah, they also did one. Uh, um, I think they also did one in in the uh, the Pacific. I think it was. Um, I can't remember what it was. Battle of the Pacific or something like that. I think it was, and it was a continuation of that. I don't know if they if they were the same characters, but I never watched that. But Band of Brothers, I've seen quite a few times. Um, it's it's, uh, it's a very moving uh, series. Um, that was a Normandy. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. And I think they uh, they had the airborne regiment. I think it was an airborne regiment originally. Um, and obviously a numerous amount of video games um, have come out of that. And I just want to go through some famous speeches. Five leg legendary speeches. So here's one from. <clears throat> this was this was broadcast on national national radio in the United States by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, he asked Americans to join him in prayer. He said, "They fight not for the lust of conquest." Jeez, sorry, I've got a whole bunch of these pop-ups have popped up. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, right. Okay, so the President Franklin D. Roosevelt asked Americans to join in prayer for Allied forces. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end... Oh, gee, this thing keeps popping up. Sorry, just bear with me a sec. Um, it keeps blocking the page here. Just bear with me here. Add block it thing keeps popping up here and it keeps covering it so I've got it open on a different screen here so um, right so we go back close that down yeah so um, Franklin D Roosevelt asked Americans to join him in prayer and on 6th of June 1944 um, he said they fight not for the lust of conquest they fight to end conquest they fight to liberate uh, the series is focusing on airborne. Yes, that's right. Easy company. That is that is correct. Uh, Red-headed step stacker, how you doing? He also warned us against the military industrial complexes, just like JFK did. Uh, we did not listen. Mm. Um, here's another one from General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces, who later became president of the U.S., delivered remarks to U.S. soldiers on D-Day minus one. So that would have been yesterday, to encourage them before heading into battle. He said, You're about to embark upon the great crusade towards, towards which we have striven, striven for these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers, <clears throat> excuse me, the hope and prayers of liberty, loving people everywhere, march with you. <clears throat> Uh, amazing words. <clears throat> uh, let's have a look and see if we got. We've got um, Ronald Reagan in 1984 for the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of D-Day. He said, "One's country is, is worth dying for. The de democracy is worth dying for because it's the most deeply honourable form of government ever devised by man." He obviously, obviously said that because uh, of the Cold War, but uh, that was interesting. <clears throat> uh, 
and they popped him as they did MacArthur. FDR was a socialist uh, curse of debt in the US, which we still pay. I mean, I think uh, the US, the, the US government during the time of World War Two made uh, made loads. I mean, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't say loads, but they were substantially making money because obviously they had people that were buying the materials at that stage. Um, I am named after Dwight D. Uh, David Eisenhower. That's cool, David. Um, we got President Barack Obama on June sixth, twenty fourteen, commemorated the seventh seventh anniversary of D Day at Omaha Beach with a speech that captured why thousands of U.S. soldiers soldiers fought that day. He said, "What more powerful manifestation of America's commitment to human freedom than the sight of wave after wave after wave?" of young men boarding these boats to liberate people they'd never met. That's very, that's very touching. <clears throat> these are people that fought for people that, I mean, if you think about it, that they, they didn't know any, they didn't know any better. Sorry. Queen Elizabeth <clears throat> on the, uh, was 18 on D-Day. On June 5th, 2009, and that was obviously yesterday, um, uh, she reflected on the day that the resilient generation of men and women who lived through it. She said, when I, when I attended the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of D-Day, of the D-Day landings, some thought it might be the last such event but the wartime generation, my generation, is resilient. So I see there's a few comments there. Yes, but the winner of the war pays all debts. Uh, that that uh, that is true. I suppose yeah, the German rebuild. Uh, the uh, I think it was called the Kellogg's um, Kellogg's plan. If I'm not, obviously uh, that uh, reconstruct Germany. You are speaking, yeah, that is, that is, I don't disagree with you there. In advance of manufacturing beyond the US Industrial Revolution equipment, I'm named after Obama. Oh, that's cool. I really like um, his, um, I really like his husband, Michelle. <laughs> Ronald Reagan turned US from one world creditor to one world debtor in eight years. That's it. I don't know much about, um, about that specific time. Wow. Uh, I thought that was very interesting anyway so we have a look at um some stuff in front of us here so i've got the sands of normandy set which we're going to open up and then i've got a coin here and um just a banknote in representing the um, some of the money during the 40s um let's take a closer look all right so here's a 1944 dime i was going through my my coinage there early and i was trying to look at something that had the date 1944 on and um, this is a 1990, sorry, 1944 S, which I got from Silver Stanger many months ago. And um, I thought it would be represented the time of D-Day. 90% silver. S mint mark. And then here's a, this is a £10 banknote. This is a South African one. I've done a separate video on this. This was done in this. is the only 40s banknotes um, I have. Or war banknotes, should I say, 1943. But this would have been £10. This is a South African reserve. So this would have been equal to 10 sterling pounds or British pounds. Still had that promise to pay the Demera on demand and Pretoria ten pounds, so you could still claim this in gold if you wanted to. Quite a nice fitting bank, nice. We're going to take a look at the Sands of Normandy set now. I'll put this to one side here. So, for those familiar with the um, with the lighters, they issued lighters to the to the GIs. That were made by Zippo, of course. This is a set here that I've had for the last 15 years. Um, I bought the set, I think it was £21. And it's limited to 10000 And this is a this is a replica of the original Zippo lighter. Uh, 
I'm not too familiar with the variety there. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by full band. Will Stalker says that banknote is my style. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh... Oh, together. <laughs> Um, is that on the reverse? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the full band, though, but... Um, let's see if I can... I presume that's some kind of variety, is it? If you look at the pillar... Is that... Um, let's do a trade. Now, unfortunately, now my banknotes are off, off a trade. I don't know if that helps. There are three horizontal lines. I'll have to have a look at it another time, though. Um, but thanks there, um, help, babe. So we're going to have a look at this. This, this is the uh, these were. This is a replica of the original lighter, which was issued to the GIs during World War Two. Um, the only significant difference between this one here is that uh, it's got five. It's got five hinges, and not three. The original ones had three, and they were they were quite uh, clunky based. And some of them actually, uh, the bottoms were made from the tops. Also, the, the metal itself, brass, was considered a, a, a vital war material because the original lighters were actually made of brass, that they made them in steel. But obviously, they were very... Um, you had to coat them, which is exactly what they did here. They coated it with a black finish. And uh, apparently, when it baked, it created a crackle effect. And that's why they refer to this lighter as a black crackle. There's the D-Day uh, Normandy stamp there, 60 years ago. That was in 1944 to 2004, which is when I bought this set. Okay, thanks, Elf, babe. I'll definitely check that out. This is limited as well, so we have a look. There's the limited number there, 4,815. Uh, there's 10,000 uh, mintage worldwide for these. You did, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen many of them now. If you look online, you just don't see them. There's only 10,000 of these, and I bet you probably majority are in um, collector's hands. I had two of these, and I sold one um, many years ago. David Collard says the bands holding the sticks are the, are the torch together are the high points of the reverse coin. Okay, thanks, man. I'll definitely check that out. Uh, there's the insert. This is just a modern insert, but the uh, the, uh, the original lighters... Oh, there you go. They've, they've made the same replica... The new uh, Zippo lighters have got an additional hole just on the bottom there. So they've kept that as uh, to the original as possible. So that would be a five, six, seven barrel, uh, seven barrel uh, chimney, seven, seven hole chimney. And there's the information on the bottom there. So this was issued in 2004. And you'll see there's a pattern mark, which the original ones had a pattern mark on it. Uh, which you can see there. So that was the original pattern. And it tells you there, Zippo Manufacturing, uh, Bradford, PA, made in USA. Uh, the bases wouldn't have had such such detail, but it would have had the pattern number and it would have had Zippo. And sometimes they, they, they didn't have enough of the metal to create the, the bottoms specifically, so they used the tops. So some of them are misshaped. Now, I, I managed to pick up... I just happened to be in an antique shop in... Um, yeah, that's correct. Lifetime guarantee. I was in an antique shop in Cape Town at the time uh, when I was living there, and I thought I'd drop in and take a look. The guy had three World War II Zippo lighters on display. He had a chrome one, which apparently are the slightly rarer one, um, and he had two of the Black Crackle ones, and I got all three of them for about... I think it was probably about $3.00. Um, so, um, they were an absolute bargain. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I managed to, um, to pick that up. And, um, I just, I sold two, I think it was a couple of years, years ago, and I've still got one left. But, um, they're worth probably about between 150 to $200 uh, each. Hey, Billy, how are you doing? Thanks very much for dropping in. You're welcome to check the uh, the chat earlier. You're welcome to play back uh, the video there. Why the normally theme today? Well, it's, uh, it's D-Day. 
uh, D-Day landings today, 6th of, 6th of June, to commemorate the D-Day landings. I'm sure you guys are probably celebrating something in the US. <laughs> there we go, it's got a new sub as well. So um, with this particular kit, you also get some Normandy sand. So this is apparently sand from Normandy. Hence why they the, the term the Sands of Normandy. I think that's pretty cool. Nice glass vial. And then this is the booklet we're going to open, which I haven't opened yet. So um, this is the booklet that, that comes with it. As you can see, it's still sealed there. So I'm going to snip this open today. And we're going to take a look. That's the first time. Sands of Normandy. The hopes and prayers of liberty people everywhere march with you. So wrote Supreme Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower in a letter sent to Allied troops before embarking on the great on, on the greatest air and sea invasion in history. The next day, June sixth, Allied forces landed on the occupied shore of Normandy and began the grueling process of liberation. As they marched into battle, soldiers carried with them weapons, rations, unfavorable courage, and their zippo lighters. <laughs> In little over a year's time, they had secured victory over the Axis powers. Operation Overlord, more commonly known as D-Day, proved to be the turning point in World War II. There's good reason our commemorative edition is named the Sands of Normandy. To make a truly special collectible, we've included from the very coast the battle well, where the battle was waged upon see section page 8 the world had changed by the sacrifices made by soldiers at Normandy in 1944 now you can have a piece of history in your hand now to honour all of those who served Zippo is proud to present the limited edition celebrate the 60th anniversary of D-Day no, no other event in history increased the popularity of Zippo lighters more than World War II during the war, the war years, Zippo's entire production went to the armed forces. The lighters were shipped to army exchanges and naval ship stores. The first thing most soldiers did upon getting their Zippo lighter was to make it their own, often etching his name, rank, battalion, or location on it. I've actually got a Zippo lighter book there that we're gonna, I'll show you in a sec with all the different um, insignias on it. Amidst the uncertainty of war, there was one thing the soldier could rely on, his Zippo lighter. <laughs> That's obviously the the, uh, the terminology there from the Zippo company. In rain, water, snow, it worked every time. The Zippo ar um, archives are filled with letters detailing the services um, that Zippo lighter was called to perform. Heating rations to helmets, lighting campfires, sparking fuses for explosives, hampering, hammering nails, <laughs> and even signalling to fellow soldiers with the famous Zippo click. Um, on several occasions, a zipper lighter in the dirt or pants pocket uh, even saved the life of, a, of of by deflecting bullets. No wonder legendary war correspondent Ernie Ernie Pyle wrote, "The zipper lighter is in great demand on the on the battlefield. Uh, it is the most coveted thing in the army." To help boost morale, Mr. Mr. Blasdale, who was the owner of the Zippo company at that that time, shipped a box of lighters every month. For the pile uh, to hand out to soldiers it was a much sought after and bartered for possession a valuable asset in the field and found uh, remembrance of home so much so the pile noted getting hold of a zippo lighter is like getting hold of a hunk of gold on on, on uh, sorry 143 dr uh, druid there says on ve day the Walker Bush family turned around supply ships destined for Germany. Families came uh, to money in the US Civil War um, as head of logistics. Wow, okay. You want to watch the the replay? This was a great live broadcast. <laughs> Thanks very much, Redhead Step Stepstacker. Yes, sir, at least, least we forget. Absolutely. Wow, okay. Well, Stogger says he's been scuba diving in Normandy. Well, that sounds great. 
Other legendary military leaders heaped similar praise on the Zippo lighter. General Eisenhower wrote to Mr. Blasdell, It is the only lighter I've got that will light at all times. <laughs> General Douglas MacArthur described his Zippo lighter as a real work of art. The lighter was was the lighter was there. That was that's what the original lighter looked like. It was wide on the case. And obviously that's some of its crackle being worn by uh, by uh, constant constant use. Uh, Billy says he collects Zippo lighters. Cool, man. Have you got the um have you got any of the World War II lighters? Lighter fluid was not always available. Gasoline, yes, that's correct. David, you're spot on, my friend. Oraja Cooley says D Day, absolutely. No, oh, unless he's asking what D Day is. It's the Normandy language. Uh, the Allies uh, landing on the on the Normandy beaches. So here we go. There's the reference to the Black Crackle lighter. Bears a simple hand carved inscription. So that would have been someone's initials put on there. Uh, Walter Nol uh, N uh, Nadler appears on the front, and the back reads June 6, nineteen forty four. Why wow, he even carved the date and the and the time on there? That's so cool. But when the Zippo employee at headquarters Bradford, Pennsylvania, found this genuine World War Two era lighter while sorting through archival material in, in the 1990s, it painted a myriad of possibilities. Did the GI carve his name and his date on it during the channel crossing uh, as a last message to loved ones? Or did he just do it after the beach was cured to create a personal memento? Did he make his way into the battle? And most important, who was Walter Nadler? Since no one at Zippo knew the answers, um, we set out to find them. As part of the D-Day 50th anniversary commemoration, we launched an international media search throughout the US and France, seeking any details of Walter Nadler. Well, check that out. There's the stuff inscribed on the back of it. Information from several sources uh, led us to Walter D. Nadler of Rathway, New Jersey who landed on Normandy in June 6 with the fighting 4th Division of the U.S. Arms, uh, Army. Unfortunately, we discovered that Nad uh, Nadler had passed away in 1990. However, his son, Walter E., referred to as Bud uh, Nadler, contacted us. Bud recalled his father talking about a Zippo lighter he had inscribed while crossing the channel. Unfortunately, <clears throat> sorry. Unfortunately, he dropped it in the sand while landing on the Utah beach. Uh, when Bud, aged 10 at the time, asked why his father hadn't stopped to find the lighter, the elder replied that losing the lighter was was the least of his worries that day. The now famous Walter Nodler lighter is proudly displayed at the Zippo Case Visitors Centre in Bradford, Bradford, Pennsylvania. Wow. That's absolutely incredible. Has anyone been to the, uh, the, the Zippo Lighter Museum there in Bradford, Pennsylvania? So I see there's a few messages there. Uh, Redhead Step Stacker says Chicago reenacted Normandy on Lake Michigan Beach 25 years. Wow, that is so cool. Nothing is planned that I can find for today. Yes, sir, David C. Sands of Normandy Certification of Authenticity. This document verifies that this light is genuine factory issued Zippo Limited Edition. Sorry, apologies for that donkeys in the background there. Uh, like every Zippo uh, windproof lighter, the Sands of Normandy lighter is backed by the world famous Zippo guarantee. And it just goes into the uh, limited edition, only 10,000 worldwide. The lighter is a replica of the design of the 1941 Zippo lighter. I wish I had my original with me. That would be fantastic just to show you the comparisons. Um, the four barrel hinge rather than the current, uh, sorry, four barrel, not three barrel. Uh, the D Day commemorative. Uh, um, also replicates the famous black crackle finish. So that's the, the finish on the actual lighter. With all brass dedicated to the war effort, Zippo was forced to fabricate the exterior cases from scrap steel. Uh, Zippo founder George uh, G. Blasdell wanted to plate the, uh, the lighters in chrome or nickel. However, just like brass, these materials were, were not available. Instead, to prevent the lighters from rusting, Zippo used a thick black paint, uh, which was baked to create uh, to a crackle finish thus produced a black crackle a surface and distinguished it as a World War II Zippo lighter. So obviously that particular finish was only issued during obviously the rep replicas 
or uh, during, when the original ones were only introduced for World War II. Inside the unit of the 41 replica is also different from today's standard Zippo lighters. The straight flat sides meet the, meet the front black surface and the chimney has fewer holes and a hollow rivet holds the striking wheel in place. The final element is authentic, authenticate our 41 replica is the bottom of the stamp which clearly displays the 04 date code. This distinguishes the lighter as a replica as opposed to an original. The shield Design em uh, emblazoned on our 60th anniversary light is, is patterned after the famous sleeve patch created for Operation Overlord and worn by Allied troops on D-Day. The laser engraving also matches the three-dimensional antique brass medallions which were featured on the Zippo D-Day 50th as the Operation Overlord pattern. I didn't, I didn't actually know that. Hmm. There's the Zippo D-Day 50th anniversary collectible. So that was another one that was the earlier one. The packaging, uh, that's another thing in regards to the packaging. That, the, that would have been the original packaging for the original lighter, obviously in a smaller size. Um, so the packaging after this commemorative mimics the K-Ration kit. So those that have seen the uh, the guys, the, there's obviously guys that do the original uh, ration openings. Yeah, it mimics the original uh, K ration uh, kits carried by the ass the, ass the assaults and combat operations, except we've replaced them with canned meats, biscuits, cheese, gum, with something more substantial. The graphics on the kit matches the Zippo pa uh, packages, designs from the 1940s, so spirits of the integral path of American history is maintained throughout the set. Sorry, I just saw a post there. June 6, 1944, D-Day, 75th anniversary. Hey, King's Coin, how are you doing? I hope you're well, my friend. Thank you for joining me, joining us here. The sand, the unique uh, component of this set is the container of sand, which was drawn from the location of the Allies termed Omar Beach. Uh, Zippo obtained the rights to acquire the pure beach sand via a special arrangement with the mayor of St. Laurent, uh, Laurent Samir in Normandy. And there's the original letter there. Oh, I, uh, I, the undersigned, Mr. Murquette, mayor of St. Beret Sumer, Calvados region of France, certify that the sand in this file is truly from the famous Omaha Beach. At 6.30 a.m. on the 6th of June 1944, the Allies disembarked onto the beach to liberate France. Obviously, this is the 60th anniversary set, this one here. 60 years later, the infamous emotion of the town is proud to celebrate the, the Zippo commemoration of this historic event. And there's a old uh, advertising, wartime advertising during the war, Zippo magazine ads had been an unusual task of promoting a consumer product that was not available on the home front as this ad stakes we now can furnish zippo windproof lighters only to our armed forces Let's see if i can get it in there zippo windproof lighters have acted as rescue beacons for men excuse me and open boats as a guide through dark, uh, uh, dense dark jungles and as a means of lighting fires for food and warmth. Uh, lighting lanterns as well as pipes for a regular duty for the Zippo and the watertight case is a lifesaver. And there's more advertising. In the dark times during the war, the humour was part of the Zippo advertising effort, as shown by the by these ads focusing on the GI. He gets he gets to sleep by counting Zippo lighters. <laughs> oh, good lord! You haven't lost your Zippo lighter. It's in your money belt, right where you left it. Oh, there's a guy doing an, an X-ray there. No, no, just passing. Flame Zippos, my lifetime sweetheart. Oh, some guy's getting a tattoo done. It's interesting. The United States World War II Memorial. On the 20th uh, of May 2004, the U.S. National World War II Memorial was dedicated on the National um, Mall um, in Washington, D.C. It is the first national monument honoring the 16 million men and women who served in uniform and the more than 400,000 Americans who gave their ultimate sacrifice during World War II. Zippo is proud to have made a sizable donation to the memorial. 
It's still serving as a lasting tribute to the spirit, sacrifice and commitments of the American people, to the common defence of the nation and to the broader causes of peace and freedom in the world. To further salute the efforts of the greatest generation, we have produced special lights as commemorating the World War II Memorial. Um, and it's this way of demonstrating how much we appreciate everything they've given us and uh, given for and to us. Zippo click. Um, just like the ones used by the GIs fighting when every Zippo lighter was made, uh, comes a story. And there's more than 400 million lighters produced. I won't go into too much detail there. Gives credits there. The Elder um, World War II Museum. Um, Eldrad, uh, Pennsylvania. Public domain photos courtesy of Dwight D. Eisenhower Library. Um, Ebeline, Kansas. The Municipality of saint laurent zemir France. The Honourable Raymond Marcoux Mayor. Probably no longer a mayor. And there's uh, that's Operation Overlord. June 6, 1944. you got England. Rallying points. And then dispersals to the appropriate uh, landing sites. And there you go. It says the St. Lorette Samir sand from Omaha Beach, Normandy. Well, thank you all for um, sharing this uh, moment with me. I'm sure you've... Um... Mr. Doughboy356, did I see you that you dropped in? How are you doing? Uh, Urija says they also put black and white stripes on the planes so that they could tell if the uh, if their planes were not enemy ones flying for Didier. That is correct. Now I'm going to show you a few more of the lighters I was referring to. These are some of the work. Uh, this is a Zippo lighter book here. Uh, the Zippo lighter companion, Avi R. Bayer, Alexander. And this goes through all the various makes. And this is what some of the GIs did with some of their lighters. Um, you can see they put their, obviously, the, you've got an um, oak leaf there. I think that was a that would have been a major, something like that. You've got the uh, the crest um, of the United States or the seal. Um, you've obviously got there's some German German coins on there as well, some French coins. Um, you can see some of the the black crackles worn off them, so it's straight down to the steel. There's another one there, U.S. Um, there's a naval um, insignia on there, and there's another one there. I think this is it. So we've got plain monograms. Um, Replicas of earnest signatures, cross rifles, army eagle emblems. Um, so, you know, the GIs decorated them with uh, all kinds of stuff. In 1942, total sales of the lighter since its introduction of the years previously reached 1 million units. From then onwards, the rate of sales would increase enormously. Despite the, the limitations imposed by availability of Zippos for materials, Zippos offered nine different designs on sale in crackle and plain steel. That was, uh, as you can see there, is the original lighter box. It's very similar to that design there. You can still see they've used the original font. And there, obviously, that's got the D-Day lighter on there. There's some advertising. Coin Sense and Nonsense, how are you doing? Uh, it's good to see. Unfortunately, I can't stay. Well, I'm I'm about to wrap up here. I've nearly uh, been live streaming for two uh, two hours there. But if you want to get some background history in regards to the um, Normandy campaign, you're welcome to go back to and uh, take a look. And um, I was just showing the Mercury 1944. It's only 1944 coin I actually have. Um, it's a Mercury dime. Um, but uh, I see we've gone up to ten there. Uh, we've got silver Steelers here as well. Um, he's just dropped in there. I hope you guys, for those that did stick around, I hope you really enjoyed that. It's, it's, uh, you collect lighters, Limey. Um, I, I, well, let's just say I've, I've still got a very keen eye. If I, I know what lighters to look for, and they're the ones I specifically uh, try and buy if I can. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of Zippo lighters in old antique shops in America that were brought back by the GIs. So if you guys are ever in antique shops... Have a look and see if you can find some old Zippo lighters. Maybe there might be a chance that uh, they don't know what they have. And they might just go, uh, you know, Zippo lighter for $5. Um, but they're extremely rare and they're worth quite a bit of money. You're probably looking at at least $150 to $200 for a Zippo lighter. Um, I, ha I picked up three. I picked them up for an absolute bargain when I was in Cape Town. I walked, went into an antique shop. Cheers, health babe. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for sticking around. Really appreciate it. 
Guido Stacken. Uh, yeah, I picked them. I picked up these three. There was one chrome or one uh, steel finish, um, and then there was uh, two black crackle lighters. And I picked all three of them up for something like five dollars. Um, it was an apps. I just couldn't believe my luck that day because I knew what I had. I looked at them and I was like, oh my god, these these are these are World War Two lighters. And of course, you've got to contain your excitement because you're like, you know. And funny enough, one of them he had listed that one wasn't working, and because I'd, I know how to fix them, um, I was I managed to get a better deal. <laughs> I asked him. I think it was something like five rand. I probably paid like a uh, dollar for it at the, at that point. Um, well, Stoger says I saw a ton of cheap lighters and awesome World War Two stuff in an old Soviet shop in us in Estonia. Wow. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. But. Um, yeah, I managed to get a better deal because I said it wasn't working. And literally when I got home, it was the flint. The flint had, uh, had, had got stuck in it. And I just pushed the flint out or just broke it down. Put a new flint in. They all light up. Um, I sold two last year. I decided to let two go. Um, I sold them for... I sold the chrome lighter for $180. And I sold the black crackle lighter. I sold that for 200 I think it was 220 And for three lighters, uh, it barely cost me $5. So it just goes to show if you've got the knowledge and you can pick up bargains somewhere, you can make money out there. And particularly with, I'd say, lighters to a degree, if you can find the right lighters, they're worth quite a bit of money. Still waiting for, for the eyes to go unblurry. <laughs> but I'm, I'm about to wrap up here now, guys. I've, I've pretty much been through everything here. You're welcome to check the playback. I spoke about the Normandy landings, the preparation for it, the forces involved. Um, in all, in regards to the Normandy campaign, um, what I'll end with here, so I'm just going to scroll back up here. Um, you had the Allies consisted of the British Empire, United States, Canada, Australia, Czechoslovakia, France, Norway, Poland. You had the commanders and leaders, obviously, uh, against Germany. You had Dwight D. Eisenhower, Bernard uh, Montgomery, Omar Bradley, Miles Dempsey, um, Trafford Early, Mallory, uh, Bertram Ramsey, Arthur Arthur Teeter. And on the German side, you had Gerd von Rundstedt, Erwin, Erwin Rommel, Leo Leo Geyer von, von Sveppenberg, uh, Friedrich Dahlmann, Hans, uh, Hans von uh, Salmuth, uh, Wilhelm Foley. Um, units involved, I've already been through the units there. Um, estimated strength of the forces of allies were 156,000 soldiers uh, that landed on D-Day um, 195,700 naval personnel um, the Germans had 50,350 plus so I think it's estimated they had 170 coastal artillery guns uh, which included 100 millimeter to 210 millimeter as well as a 320 millimeter rocket launchers the losses um, the Allies um, suffered casualties of 10,000. Oh, they're, they're about um, 4,400 unfortunately lost their lives. 185 M4 Sherman tanks were lost. Four to 9,000 um, rounded up, which probably means that they're, they're not really sure. On the German side, they lost between four to 9,000 casualties, which I find very interesting considering they probably had the upper hand from a defensive uh, structure. And uh, considering they had 50,000 men, um, so I thought that was very interesting. But um, it'd be interesting to see what other, you know, sort of shows are going to are gonna have in regards to D-Day uh, being today. Um, I, was, I was thinking about maybe going to a museum, but obviously Ireland didn't take part in, in, in World War II. So there's not really any, any war museums as such. They only took part in World War I. Um, so you'd have to pretty much go to Britain or, or or France to go to the sort of war museums there to celebrate World War Two, really. Um, Silver Steeler just saying hello there to uh, Billy. Um, every time I get in a stream, someone calls me right after. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm going to wrap up here now. So guys, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate you all. Uh, for those that have stuck the, the podcast out, that have listened through all me, droning on about uh, troop emplacements and aircraft used, uh, the um, the planning stages, what was involved. Um, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you all, including yourselves. I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are. Remember the uh, the, uh, the soldiers and the, and the casualties 
uh, are from World War, well, from Normandy, from World War Two, that lost their lives, unfortunately, in this in this great war. Um, but um, I hope you guys have a fantastic day wherever you are, and um, I know what you mean, <laughs> David. Take care, uh, Guido. Guido Stacken, thank you very much for dropping in there. Uh, Billy as well. Billy Billy Gagney, Silver Steeler, Will Will Stalker, Mister Doughboy three five six. Uh, Mr. Dobo said trench lighter. Just give me one second. He said something about trench lighter. Sorry, I'm going to go back up there. I have a trench lighter made by a soldier from a World War... Wow, that sounds interesting. You must do a video on that, please. Uh, or you can just email me a photo if you like. That would be awesome. I'd really love to see that. A little home, homemade lighter. Thanks very much, everybody. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you're uh, if you're new. Um, please like, comment afterwards if you wish. I uh, hope you have a fantastic day and thanks for joining me on this stream. Take care, everybody. Thanks very much for watching. Hey, Penny Hunter, you'd have to check the, the stream out. Um, you can go back and see some history in regards to the Normandy beaches um, if you want to. It's all there, but have a fantastic day wherever you are. Thanks for dropping in, Penny Hunter. Take care, everybody.